And thank you all for turning out. What a wonderful house this is. I'm James Brooks, president of SAR, as many of you know. And this is a continuation of our literary arts program sponsored by the Lannan Foundation. And given the nature of the evening involving storytelling, I need to, to tell a little story of the background uh, to this evening. That, As many of you know, the school was founded in 1907. We're in our 105th year. And we were founded by extraordinary visionary and entrepreneur and uh, somewhat uh, abrasive gentleman by the name of Dr. Edgar Lee Hewitt, who was quite confident of his vision for the future of the school. And at the time he created the school, he uh, put it to the task, created a mission around the fulfillment of what he called the science of man which most specifically involved archaeological research and anthropological uh, ethnographic work. But even in 1907, Edgar Lee Hewitt specifically included the clause in the mission statement, and art in all its branches. And we've long been fascinated by his kind of perspective on that, because generally the social sciences and the humanities have tend to live, live in different bunkers, very separate bunkers, over the last century. But Hewitt somehow had a different kind of vision. And as you know, um, for the last you know, 95 years or so, the, the school has done a great deal to include the arts in our programming. We have the extraordinary collection of Southwest Native Arts that we steward at the Indian Arts Research Center. We have a long history of supporting Native artists in residence, Native seminar, art seminars, and a, a strong publications program that has come out of that. We've also had, had the honor to support some remarkable Native writers, and Scott Mamaday, of course, uh, Jerry Visner, the Ojibwa novelist and literary critic, and the poet Suzanne Schoen Harjo. But we've never had the opportunity to fully pursue the literary arts in the way that we thought that Edgar Lee Hewitt had in mind until we were able to uh, develop this relationship with the Lannan Foundation. And I want to thank Patrick Lannan, who is with us here tonight, uh, that really, you know, yeah. Where would this town be without the Lannan Foundation? Where would Marfa, Texas be without the Lannan Foundation, right? Um, and and what, what this program allows us to do is to not only uh, support in native and indigenous arts, we now have indigenous writers in residence annually. We had the Cherokee poet Santee Frazier a year ago, and then just this year the Maidu Konko poet and musician Janice Gould with us in residence but it also allowed us to expand out beyond the sphere of indigenous writers into a broader realm of, of writers globally. And uh, as many of you may have, have enjoyed, we've, we've had the pleasure of hearing from Malena Morling, who is with us. Raise your hand back there, Malena, who is a Swedish poet, and she's the translator of Tomas Transromer, the, the uh, winner of the Nobel Prize and poetry this year, and she's actually with us in residence this year, uh, but she, she's a member of our faculty as well, so she has given a reading. Uh, we had the master of the short story, Al Heathcock, with us last fall, a really brilliant collection of, of short stories called Volt, and he was with us at SAR. Um, and believe it or not, then, we somehow had the opportunity to bring Dea Obrett, and there's a story in that. And it doesn't actually reflect well on me or the school or even Patrick Lannan. Because as you know, from if many of you, have you all read, most of you read The Tiger's Wife? Right, okay, we got a, got a good house here. Uh, the Tiger's Wife, and of all the many narrative strands in that book, family and friendship figure very centrally in that. And uh, about a year ago, I had chased down the novel, The Tiger's Wife, after reading the review in the New York Times, and I had read it and been stunned by both its, its deep anthropological content, and that if you ever want to read a novel that really delves deeply into the way that history and memory get suppressed and then resurface in, in extraordinary forms, I think the novel does that, that very, very gently 
and humanely, that no one is vilified in this novel, and I think that's really important. But I had read the novel, and I share with uh, Colleen, or Carol Sandoval, who is our personnel director at SAR, a love for good contemporary fiction. So I finished this book, and I came into the office, and I ran into her office, and I said, look, you've got to read this novel. And I held it up, and she said, Colleen knows her. And I thought, what? Colleen is Carol's daughter. And I thought, no, I, I know Colleen. I know Colleen's a son of a senior. Where did she? But in fact, Colleen was in school in Ithaca, New York, as was Taya in school in Ithaca, New York. And they had become close friends through the literary arts community in that town. And it was through the good services, really, of Colleen and Carol that I was able to get in touch with Taya and say, listen, we have an opportunity to bring you here to Santa Fe, and would you please come? And, of course, Taya said yes. So that's the story behind getting someone who has been rather busy the last year. She just came back from how many days in Germany? You did 10 days and been like, nine talks or something, including an actress on stage who read from the book in German, which was kind of interesting. Um, so we're really delighted to welcome Tam. I think many of you know her biography. She's born in Belgrade in 1985, uh, fled the Yugoslav Wars with her family in, in 92, uh, first to Cyprus, then to Cairo, Egypt, then ultimately in 97, came to the United States, uh, she entered the University of Southern California at age 16, rapidly moved through there, went on to Cornell uh, to do an MFA in Literary Arts. Her um, project for that was a draft of what became The Tiger's Wife. And then, of course, it was published um, just last year. Uh, won the Orange Prize, National Book Finalist, and last time I checked, 23 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. So what I want to do is ask you all to welcome Taya Obrett, and let's hear about her work. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction, James. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks to SAR and the Lannan Foundation both. Um, and thank you all for being here, and especially thanks to Carol and Colleen and David and Michael um, for, <laughs> for having me here, um, and the entire Sandoval family. Um, so this, is a, this is actually, I've been on tour um, off and on, but mostly on, since March of last year, and this is my last tour date. Um, so this is, this is, this is sort of, it's a <laughs> so, uh, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, with all of you and, and in this, and in this capacity. So thank you so much, um, for having me. I realized that, um, I realized as I was preparing for this that, that, uh, the format for this is slightly different, uh, which is sort of awesome for me because, um, it, it, uh, you know, obliges me to interact with the work of other writers, um, and boy do I love other writers, uh, really quite a lot more than I than my own work. So I was like, great, I'll just read from everybody else and then at the end I'll be like, this much for me. Um, I, um, so the format of this is slightly different and, and new to me, so I, I, I hope that, uh, th I hope that it, it works, um, that I've tried. Um, I was thinking, you know, as, as I was preparing for this, um, what do I, oh, and I'm sorry, I totally forgot, but thank you also to Rumelia, who were here. Thank you again. It's my brain, yes. They, they're gone. They're around the corner, um, but <laughs> they'll be back. Um, so I was, I was thinking, um, you know, what do I most want to say? And and as you sort of get going with with something, it, it turns out that you say many things that you, you know, you you play, you intended to say so many things in in uh, in one of these presentations, and then it turns out that you say quite a lot less than you had intended, or it goes off on some tangent. But um, I think that the the whole purpose of this talk to me is is to discuss how amazing um, I found it that so much of the writing process is subliminal and uh, how much you learn about yourself in the act of writing. It's sort of like individual anthropology. <laughs> You're like, oh, where did this come from? Um, I, um, I grew up in the Balkans. Uh, and uh, for, for, for those of you who may be here uh, who had a similar experience um, or, or you know have grown up around Balkan culture, you know that it's all about 
stories and myths and superstitions, um, and that much of this is sort of inexplicable, you know, in sort of a general sense. Um, I, uh, I, I, one of the things that I learned uh, sort of about, about coming from the Balkans is that all stories there turn out to be epic stories, no matter what. Um, and and you like whether you like it or not. So it's never s as simple as like this morning I got up, I realized it was Johnny's birthday and I ran around the corner to get him some flowers. And I'm back and here I am. Uh, which would be sort of the normal way of telling a story. In the Balkans, it's like this morning I woke up, but last night I had thought I would not wake this morning. <laughs> For a dark omen had presented itself between the two buildings across the street. But now that I, I, I was here this morning, I thought, oh, it is, it is Johnny's birthday. That must be why I survived the night. <laughs> so I will go around the corner and buy him some flowers to thank him. And on the way there, I fell down the stairs. And it was, it was truly traumatic. But at the bottom of the stairs, I was helped up by a kindly man that I did not recognize. But when I looked a little bit better in the light, I realized that he was the downstairs neighbor who has been my arch enemy. We've been having some trouble over our potted plants. So he helped me up, and then he walked with me to the flowers so that I would not feel alone. But on the way there, we almost got ran over by a truck. <laughs> and it was very difficult to get those flowers, for I had not the correct change. <laughs> and then on the whip, and so, you know, woe betide you if you happen to meet this person in the corner, like, as they're coming back from the flower shop, because the story's really fresh, you know. On the other <laughs> hand, on the other hand, um, at its, in its freshest form, it is the shortest version of that story you're going to get. Because, because by the time it goes through you and like six other people, and then like like you know by the time the seventh person gets that story, it's like an epic a mile long. You know, villains have been added. You know, characters have been subtracted. The um, the general theme of it has really really changed. So there was that. There was sort of this idea of, of epic stories, um, and then there's also sort of interesting superstitions. Um, that I grew up with, you know, in my household, and we moved, you know, we, we left, we left uh, what is now Serbia when I was seven, and we lived in Cyprus, and we lived in Egypt, um, and I mean, these aren't exactly places where, like, stories are, you know, I mean, the stories there are like, whoa, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, they're places that, that live steeped in, in mythology and history, and um, it, that was fascinating. It went, you know, hand in hand with with the kind of upbringing that I was getting in the in the household itself, which included things like my grandmother, who is, you know, a wonderful woman. Um, but she would sort of I, I realized as I as I became older that like there were there were things that she would put around the house like as trinkets, like like amulets against different things. Like one time I bent down to pick up something that had rolled under the bed, and I was like, Grandma, why do you have like nine pairs of scissors under here? Would, have you lost them? Do you want me to get them out? And she'd be like, no, leave them there. They cut evil. And I was like, OK. And it took me a really long time. Like, I almost became a full adult before I realized, like, other people's grandmothers, they don't do this. <laughs> you know? Like, they, you know, they, they do other things. They bake cookies, but they don't, like, cut evil with scissors. Um, other things that sort of made it difficult to assimilate eventually into American culture, like, you can't praise babies, like, especially newborns because you're bringing on this sort of strange bad luck to the baby, right? Like if you say the baby's beautiful, somebody down below is going to hear you and like come up and like, I don't know, like draw like a mustache on the baby's face and be like, ha ha, now the baby's not beautiful anymore. So um, best case scenario. Um, <laughs> So, so what, something that we do in my house is like, especially if it's a newborn, you know, you like spit on the baby. You're like, Phew. and try that doing, you tried doing that, you know, the first time, like when you try doing that in the States, like it doesn't fly so well. <laughs> like <laughs> like you, somebody walks by with a baby, and you're like, oh, poo. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same sort of resonance. So I, I would, you know, I would develop coping mechanisms. I'd be like, I'm an immigrant, like I'll deal with this. So, you know, I would, I would, uh, I would eventually start doing like a little sing song. Like I'd be like, toot, 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 and they think you're like cooing to the baby. Instead, you're like spitting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> symbolically spitting. Um, but I, so I, I grew up with, with you know, these, these strange, um, seemingly strange beliefs, but, and, and, and superstitions, and like, like a, a very complex way of telling stories. And um, all of these were th um, elements in which uh, magic and reality intersected. Um, and I was raised in a, in a, 
tri-religious household, <laughs> uh, we, you know, and, and that was a big part of the, the solution of the Balkans, you know, there was sort of a religious conflict there, and in my house, we were Yugoslav, so, you know, my grandma's a Bosnian Muslim, my grandfather was a Roman Catholic, Slovene, and my stepdad is an Orthodox Serb, so we have Christmas twice, and like according to the, you know, according to which tradition it is, it's like, okay, well, Christmas is like really cheerful on the 25th, but then when it's Christmas again on January 7th, like it's a very somber kind of thing. Like you eat the unleavened cake and like you're very sad. I don't know why you're sad, but you eat like a fish and an unleavened cake and that's very sad. So <laughs> all these things. Um, so intersection of magic um, and reality. And I, and I think that as a child growing up, I was very drawn to the literature of Eastern Europe as a result of that because it felt very much like home. Um, and so it, uh, it, it I, I don't think it was a, people, you know, people describe my work as magical realism and they sort of ask me whether it's something that I consciously chose to do and I really didn't. It was just something that like was there uh, in my childhood. If uh, magical realism is, is um, you know, is allowed to be a term that's used for Eastern European uh, literature because I, my understanding is that it's typically used for, for, South and for Latin American um, literature. Um, so I thought that I would, um, read a passage um, from my favorite book, um, which is The Master Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. If you haven't read it, run out and buy it now. Um, <laughs> or you can get my copy. No. Um, no. Uh, and uh, I, I was going to read this, this passage because I, I feel that it sort of very aptly um, portrays what uh, th th that kind of insertion of magic into a very real scene. Um, Bulgakov was a, was a Russian writer um, during the Stalinist era, and he sort of, he wrote um, protest literature of a very aggressive nature, and he was censored up and down, I mean, until he died, and, and he died not knowing that this book was going to be published. It was assembled finally by his widow and published several years, years after his death. Um, I'm like, I'm looking at James, I'm like, is that right? <laughs> or have I just done a Balkan thing and like really blown this up? Um, but uh, but I so um, this is a this is a passage in which it's sort of difficult to pick any part of the Master and Margarita where anything makes sense unless you've been reading from the very beginning. But this is a I, I feel this is a passage that uh, sort of aptly shows um, Eastern European magical insertion that that is a, an influence for me. Um, sort of what you need to know is there's two people there's two people uh, 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 an editor and a poet sitting on a bench. Uh, at the beginning of the book, and uh, they sort of start to notice these strange characters appearing. It's a it's summer's evening, and uh, one of them tells them a story about Jesus and Pontius Pilate and predicts that the editor will meet his death uh, shortly, and the editor gets up and gets run over by a tram immediately, and the poet is in a state of shock, and he tries to catch this professor who's been telling him all this and his accomplice who's this choir master and then this happens. The poet's name is Ivan. <clears throat> Ivan groaned, looked off into the distance and saw the hateful stranger. He was already at the exit to Patriarch's Lane and he wasn't alone. The more than dubious choir master had managed to catch up with him and that wasn't all. The third member of the company who had appeared out of nowhere turned out to be a cat big as a hog and pitch black, like a crow or like soot, and sporting a mustache like a reckless cavalryman's. The threesome set off down Patriarch's Lane with the cat walking on its hind legs. Yvonne rushed off in pursuit of the villains and soon realized that catching up with them was going to be very difficult. The threesome tore down the lane in a flash and were on Spiridonkovna. No matter how much Ivan quickened his pace, the distance between pursuer and pursued never shortened. Before the poet could realize what was happening, he had left the peaceful Spiridonkovna behind and found himself at Nikitsky Gates, where his plight worsened. Here, there was a huge crowd, and when Ivan rode into one, when, I'm sorry, and when Ivan ran into one of the passers-by, he was showered with curses. It was here, moreover, that the villainous gang resorted to that favorite outlaw strategy. They split up and went in different directions. With great agility, the choir master corkscrewed himself into a moving bus going to Arbat Square and disappeared. After losing one of the pack, Ivan focused all his attention on the cat. He saw the bizarre feline walk over to the steps of an A streetcar that was standing at the stop 
rudely push aside a woman who let out a shriek, grab onto the handrail, and even try to thrust a 10 kopeck piece at the conductress through the window, open because of the heat. The cat's behavior so amazed Ivan that he froze in his tracks next to a grocery store in the corner, only then to become even more amazed by the behavior of the conductress. As soon as she saw the cat climbing onto the streetcar, she began shouting with such fury that she shook all over. Cats aren't allowed. No passengers with cats. Shoo, get off or I'll call the police. But neither the conductress nor the passengers were amazed by the most important thing of all, namely that a cat was not merely getting on a streetcar, which wasn't so bad, but that he intended to pay his fare. <laughs> the cat turned out to be not only a fare-paying beast, but a disciplined one as well. At the first yell from the conductress, he stopped in his tracks, got off the streetcar, and sat down at the stop, stroking his whiskers with his 10 kopeck piece. But no sooner did the conductress pull the cord and the streetcar start to move than the cat did just what anyone who has been kicked off a streetcar and still has somewhere to go would do. He let all three cars go by, then jumped onto the coupler in the back of the last one, grabbed onto a piece of tubing that stuck out of the back with his paw, and sailed off, saving himself 10 kopecks in the bargain. <laughs> so um, that's, that's the introduction of uh, Behemoth, who is... Who is the cat, and, and he's, um, he's sort of the, he's the devil's crony, and he's there, they're all there to do terrible things in, in Stalinist Russia, and it's like the greatest book ever written, and just amazing. And one of those books that um, really makes me happy to be alive at this time when it like exists in the world, <laughs> you know what I mean? I would, I would be a much sadder individual if I existed before it was here. Um, to read, available to read. Um, so that was the kind of literature that I, I loved, and uh, it made me realize that I, I wanted to, to write. Um, I read this book fairly young. Um, I had already sort of made a decision um, that I was like, I'm going to be a writer and struggling artist. It would be a great time. My mother was like, help. Um, I, um, so I, you know, I, I was uh, reading books like this, reading books like... Um, uh, the Master Margarita and, and uh, Garcia Marquez's Love in the Time of Cholera, which was I was also going to read from, but then I couldn't pick a passage, so I, I decided that was sort of to no avail. Um, and um, I was in L.A. Um, as an undergrad, and I couldn't believe it. Like, I was already there, and uh, I had decided to do creative writing, and my mother was like, okay, just, you know, also pick some sort of vocation vocational backup plan, so I got also a degree in art history. <laughs> It's like, yes, there you go. Um, BAs in English and art history are equally useful, um, just by themselves. Um, and um, and w when I was a senior, um, something wonderful happened. I ended up in, in T.C. Boyle's class and sort of writing sto uh, stories sort of much more seriously. And he was a wonderful mentor. And uh, I learned in that class that there was such a thing as a program where you could go and like write and that was called an MFA, and there were apparently such things that like nur nur nourished and nurtured writers, and you could go there and, and try your hand at it, and I was like, this is a great idea. I will do this. Um, and signed up and, and got into Cor uh, applied and got into Cornell, and uh, it was a really exciting time in my life because this was like the first real decision I'd ever made. I was like, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to go over there now. And uh, then something uh, terrible happened. My grandfather, with whom I was very close and who had raised me and who had lived with us sort of throughout all these uh, transitions in life, uh, died quite suddenly and unexpectedly um, of cancer uh, in 2006, uh, two days before my college graduation. Um, and it was a big shock to me, and it was the, the, the first time anybody in, in my, my family in my life had, had, had died. And... Uh, I sort of went through the grieving period and, you know, it was, it was like a month, two months, and I was like, okay, well, I'm fine now, you know, I've come to understand what this means, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go to Cornell and be a writer. And, um, you know, I, I had this fantasy about what my life there was going to look like. Um, and uh, it, was, it was sort of this I ideal, like, I would be sequestered in my tiny apartment, and the snow will fall, and I will make hot cocoa <laughs> and, and write my books. And it would be truly a wondrous time. And, um, and, you know, I was really excited about seasons moving from L.A. I mean, that was a big deal. And, uh, you know, moved to upstate New York. And that's sort of the equivalent of, I think, moving to upstate New York from here. I mean, like, that, that's just 
well, actually, no, you guys get snow, so never mind. But um, I was told this by Colleen. <laughs> and um, so I moved there, and you know, in this sort of belief, like, now it's time to write. My grandfather's dead. Um, and uh, I'm there, and you know, the seasons change, and I'm like, wow. And uh, the snow starts to fall, and I'm still like, wow. And then uh, after the third time, I dug up the wrong car from the snow pile <laughs> because at like first scratch, it was the right color, but I didn't know then to like dig up the license plate to make sure it was mine. You know, I'd dig it up and be like, this isn't a Nissan. <laughs> What's this? I was like, I've had enough of seasons. Um, and I began uh, spending a great deal of my time in... Uh, in, in my apartment, which was subterranean, like you would stand underground and there was this, like the window ledge was to your waist. And so when the snow fell, you could sort of see it burying you like a little hourglass and you'd be like, well, time to write. <laughs> which was a lot less glorious than this. <laughs> I'm going to write now, I'm inspired. Um, and, uh, and I was sort of starting to get these weird, interesting emotional responses. Like I would be at home alone and I'd be like, if I die in this snowstorm, my mother will call and call and no one will find me. And it was, it was weird at first that I was getting these responses, but I did not associate it in any way with my grandfather's death or with any kind of um, emotional impulse to work on a project um, that was related to it or to work it out on paper or to try to reason with it. Um, or then I would, I would be like, well, that, that chicken is, uh, is really raw in the middle. You know, I was learning how to cook, too, which, which involved a lot of fire. And I'd be like, well, that chicken didn't really come out as expected. Maybe, maybe I'll get salmonella and die. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't make an association that this had anything to do with, like, a recent death. You know, it was still like, like, that has nothing to do with it. Like, death was coming up everywhere. I was having all these nightmares, but nothing. Never mind. And um, that winter, I was watching television, of all things. And this National Geographic show comes on about Siberian tigers. And it's, it's very interesting. I'm snowed in. And uh, it's about this Russian researcher who has two Siberian tigers who are um, sort of semi-captive. And he's raised them from cubhood. And he has this wife. Uh, and her job is to talk them out of these massive tiger rages that they fall into uh, when they like, realize they're captive. Um, which happens like once a day, you know, at like three o'clock. <laughs> um, and, uh, and she, you know, she goes to the fence and she talks to them and they just melt. I mean, there's like massive Siberian cats and they're just like at the gate. And I was like, this is interesting. Tiger and his wife and Tiger's wife. So I sit down and I write a short story called The Tiger's Wife. Um, and suddenly, it's, it's about this little boy who observes an interaction between uh, a deaf mute woman uh, who's, she's a circus performer, she's come to the village looking for her circus performing tiger who's escaped. And it's in the Balkans. And that was sort of a surprise for me. I was like, what are these Balkans doing here? And then it was suddenly towards the end of the story, it was all this stuff about death. And, um, and the arrival of death and, and sort of uh, the, the fate of the tiger and the fate of everybody and the fate of, you know, death, death, death. And I was like, what does this mean now? Oh, well. And I went to workshop and I was like, I'm very excited about my tiger story. Like, what do you guys think? And, and you know, in the workshop, you sit with eight people. They, like, read your work and then they, you know, they tell you good or bad. And I have never been destroyed in such a way in 25 minutes by eight people in my entire life. It was just shocking. Um, they were like, we hate this, <laughs> it's an outline, what is this? And they were right, I mean, in the end. And uh, one, of my, one of my good friends had a very good comment, and I remember it, he's a writer too, Alexi Zentner. Um, he said, this, this is a story with, with pitchforks in it, like pitchfork-wielding rabble. And I know you're writing about the Balkans, but this is not Frankenstein. So get those pitchforks out of there. And I was like, okay, so there's no pitchforks. Um, and I, I continued to write, and, and, and this relationship between the little boy and the tiger was something that I really wanted to expand on. And I, you know, was working on it and then this girl started to fascinate me in the story and their relationship. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll develop this. I'll make something of it, a better short story. And uh, I continued to write and at 40, you know, it was 25 pages to start with. At 45 pages, I was like, this is still really terrible. 
And at like 60 pages, I was like, this is less terrible. It's still garbage, but now it's been diluted by like the other things around it that are less garbagey. So that's, that's good news. And suddenly, this little boy became the grandfather of a narrator who was struggling to understand the reasons behind his death. And I was like, nope, no relation here, all fiction. And, um, and then the funniest thing happened, which was, um, you know, as, as incoming MFAs, we'd all had this fantasy that, you know, we were there, we had arrived as short story writers, but at some glorious moment in your tenure as an MFA, you would awake and realize, I'm ready, today's the day that I'm ready to write a novel. And you would show up in workshop and you'd be like in a dead sweat and shaking. And your, you know, your comrades would be like, what's wrong with you? And you'd be like, well, I've been thinking, and I, I think that I'm emotionally and psychologically ready to undertake this journey. It is a great journey. It will be great for me and great for all of us. Who's with me? And you'd, you know, you'd cheer, and confetti would be thrown in the air, and they'd hoist you up on, your on their shoulders and hoist you about the room. And this didn't happen. For me, it was, it's 45 pages, garbage. It's 60 pages, garbage. At 80 pages, I can't call it a short story anymore. It must be a novel. <laughs> and that was pretty terrifying. Um, and it became about stories and, and myths and, um, and about how people understand one another through myths and, and, the, and the sort of the versions of stories that people choose to believe uh, about their loved ones and about themselves and, and what that, that says about them. And um, at some point I, I began to realize that this was perhaps related in some way to my grandfather's death. <laughs> um, and you know, finished the novel, and um, it was very strange, and, and, and I, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was accepted by Random House, which was, like, insane. Um, and, uh, and then I went through a round of edits, and then I went vampire hunting in Serbia and Croatia for Harper's Magazine, <laughs> which was a, a fascinating sort of uh, anthropological venture because uh, it forced me, even though the novel was finished, and I, I felt certain parts of it were not resonating even with me as the writer, uh, it forced me to go door to door uh, in villages uh, in the Balkans where I had never been before because I was a city kid and knock on people's doors and ask really uncomfortable questions like, knock, knock, will you tell me about your vampire? <laughs> Which is a question that, that people like, they don't respond to it the same way. Like there's, there's sort of a variety of answers that you can get to that question. The most common one is the door slam in your face. Uh, a, a second one is, you know, yeah, come on in. And then they, you know, ply you with a great deal of rakia, and after about six shots, they start to tell you the story, which is the foundation of their whole community. Um, so I, I learned new myths and the way villages process myths and the way myths pass from person to person and went home and, and like, took this book back from my editor and I was like, sorry, I gotta work on this for six more months and we were planning on publishing it. Um, and um, it made the book a lot better, um, this sort of new understanding of mythology. And after that, I encountered Joseph Campbell and the power of myth. Um, and uh, that, was, that was very life-changing for me. And uh, I wanted to read a, a, a passage um, from it, and I, 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 had, I had serious trouble picking out which one, because there's so many parts of this that after the writing of the book, I realized related psychologically to the process that I was going through in, in, in writing that, um, that I just, I, I was astounded. Um, and my mind was blown. Um, but I think that, um, you know, he, he really hits it in this particular, in this particular moment in his conversation with, with Bill Moyers, and I'm just going to read through Campbell and Moyers as if they're one person. I know they're not, th but this is, this is an interview between two people, and it's, um, it is two people speaking, but that would be confusing, so I'm just going to read through. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is an incredible and, and, and influential thing for me, so I thought I would read from this as well. <coughs> so he says, People say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive, so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonances within our own innermost being and reality, so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. That's what it's fi all finally about, and that's what these clues help us to find within ourselves. Myths are clues. 
Myths are clues to the spiritual potentialities of the human life, what we're capable of knowing and experiencing within. And the definition of a myth changes from the search for meaning to the experience of life. The mind has to do with meaning. What's the meaning of a flower? There's a Zen story about a sermon of the Buddha in which he simply lifted a flower. There was only one man from among his disciples who gave him a sign with his eyes that he understood what was said. There's no meaning. What's the meaning of the universe? What's the meaning of a flea? It's just there, that's it. And your own meaning is that you're there. We're so engaged in doing things to achieve purposes of outer value that we forget that the inner value and the rapture that is associated with being alive is what it's all about. And how do you get that experience? You read myths. They teach you that you can turn inward and you begin to get the message of the symbols. Read other people's myths, not those of your own religion, because you tend to interpret your own religion in terms of facts. But if you read the ones, the other ones, you begin to get the message. Myth helps you to put your mind in touch with this experience of being alive. It tells you what the experience is. And um, he says, we all need to tell our story to understand our story. We need to understand death and to cope with death. And we all need help in our passages from birth to life and then to death. We need for life to signify, to touch the eternal, to understand the mysterious, to find out who we are. And uh, that, that was flabbergasted. Um, and it, it sort of, in retrospect, made so much sense in relation to what I ended up, uh, what, what the process of writing the book um, came to mean for me. Um, and I would like to sort of close all this by reading um, one of the myths uh, from The Tiger's Wife, one of the, one of the stories that uh, centers in The Tiger's Wife. And um, the book is, is about uh, Natalia, who's a doctor. Um, and uh, she finds out that her beloved grandfather has died under very mysterious circumstances, and she's on a mission of mercy, you know, elsewhere across the border, and she tries to piece together uh, what happened to him through the, the stories of his own life, through the myths that he told about encounters in his life and, and through the stories that she learns about him. Um, and this is uh, one of them. This is a significant story that sort of follows him throughout his life and a character that keeps appearing um, in his life. And this is the first time he encounters that character. And uh, this is, most of the book is first person from uh, Natalia's point of view. Uh, this segment is the grandfather's point of view, and I've tried, like, in the past to do that sort of, like, like distinguished uh, gentleman in his 70s voice, and I tried it once, and I'll never do it again. Uh, so you will just have to bear with me and, uh, and uh, imagine that this is him speaking, um, and not me. <coughs> this is late summer. 54, not 55, because that's the year I met your grandma. I am first triage assistant for the battalion, and my apprentice, God rest him, or intern, as you would call it, is this brilliant little Hungarian fellow who has paid a lot of money to study at our university and who doesn't speak a word of the language. God knows why he's not in Paris or London. He's that apt with a scalpel, but he's not apt at much else, though. At any rate, a call comes in from this village where there is a sickness. Some people have died, and those still living are afraid. There is a terrible cough and blood on their pillows in the morning. This is about as mysterious to me as an empty milk saucer when there's a big, fat cat in the room, and the cat has a ring of milk on its whiskers, and everyone is asking where the milk is. So we hitch a wagon ride to this village. The man who greets us is called Marek. He is the son of the big man in town and has been to university. He is the man who sent the wire asking us to come. He is short and stocky, and he leads us through the village and into his father's house. Marek's sister is this fat, pleasant-looking woman, very much what you'd expect. She gives us coffee and bread with cheese, which is a nice change from all that porridge we've been eating back at the barracks. Then Marek says, gentlemen, something new is at hand. I expect he will say, the epidemic's gotten worse, more death, mass hysteria, I am partly right, especially about the hysteria. Apparently, this is how it stands. A man has died, and there has been a funeral. At the funeral, this man, who is called Gabo, sits up in his coffin and asks for water. 
It is an immense surprise. Three o'clock in the afternoon, the procession is following the casket up the churchyard slope to the plot. First, there's the noise of the body sliding in the coffin, and when the lid comes off, there he is, this man Gabo, as pale and blue-faced as the day they found him floating belly up in a pond some way from town. He sits up in his pressed suit, hat in hand, folded purple napkin in his pocket. An immense surprise. High up, held aloft in his coffin like a man in a boat, he looks around the procession with red eyes and says, water. That is all. By the time the pallbearers have realized what's happened, by the time they've dropped the coffin and fled like crazy men into the church, this man has already fallen back into the casket. That is what Marek tells us regarding this new development. From where we are sitting in Marek's house, I can see out the open door and down the road leading across the field and through the churchyard. I have only just noticed that the town is very empty and that at the door of the little church, there is a man with a pistol, the undertaker, Marek tells me, who hasn't slept for six days. I am already thinking it would be far more productive to help this man, the undertaker. Meanwhile, Marek is still telling the story, and in it, the man Gavo does not rise from his coffin again. This is helped by the fact that some unknown member of the funeral procession fires two bullets from an army pistol into the back of his head while he's sitting up in the coffin right after the pallbearers drop it. Never mind why someone is so very prepared to fire a gun at a funeral. Marek only tells us this part of the story after he has had two or three glasses of plum brandy. I am taking notes this whole time and wondering about how this gavo ties into the sickness I am there to treat. When Marek mentions the two bullets, I put my pencil down and say, so the man was not dead. No, no, Marek says, most assuredly he was dead. Before the bullets were fired, I ask him, because it seems to me that this whole business is taking a different route, and now they're just making things up to cover murder. Marek shrugs and says, it is a surprise, I know. I continue to write, but what I am writing does not make much sense, and Marek looks with interest across the table and reads what I am writing upside down. My assistant, who I suspect has not understood any of this, is staring intently at me for some sort of explanation. I say... We will have to see the body. Marek's hands are on the table, and I can see that he is a man who bites his nails when he is nervous. He has been biting them a lot recently. He says to me, are you sure that's necessary? We will have to see it. I don't know about that, doctor. I've been making a list of all the people I want to speak with, anyone who is sick, all the family members of this revenant fellow, Gavo, and especially the priest and undertaker who are most likely to know about his condition before he was shot. I say to Madek, many people are at risk here if the man was sick. He was not sick. I'm sorry? He was perfectly healthy. My assistant is looking in abject confusion from Madek to myself. He has known me long enough to process that the expression on my face is probably not one of delight, and he is obviously puzzled by what is going on. Madek himself doesn't look too good either. I say, very well then, I will tell you how I see it. As far as the village goes, including Mr. Gavo himself, I am confident that my findings will arrive at a diagnosis of consumption, tuberculosis. It is consistent with the symptoms you've described to me, the bloody cough and so forth. I would like to have all the people who are sick, assembled in your town hospital as quickly as possible, and would like to place this town under quarantine until we can assess the extent of the illness. And here, he catches me off guard, because he says sharply, what do you mean tuberculosis? He looks very distraught, and I would expect him to be distraught at tuberculosis, but I would expect a different kind of alarm. The way he looks at me, I feel like my diagnosis doesn't suit him, like it's inadequate, not severe enough. He says, couldn't it be something else? I tell him, no, not with these symptoms, not with people falling dead one by one and leaving bloody pillows behind. I tell him that it will be all right, that I will send out for medicine, for nurses, another city physician to help me. He asks, what if it doesn't help? I tell him it will. If it's tuberculosis, he says, if you're right. I am not entirely certain where this is going. What if you're wrong, he says. What if it's something else? By this time, he's very agitated, and he says, I don't think you understand, sir. I really doubt you understand. I ask him to tell me about it. Well, says Marek, there is blood on our pillows, and there was blood on the lapels of Gavo's coat. Because you shot him. 
Madoc fall, almost falls out of his seat. I didn't shoot him, doctor. He was already dead. I'm scribbling again, mostly just to look official. My assistant is sweating in frustration. I say I will need to speak with his family. He has no family, Madoc says. He's not from around here. He was some sort of peddler from far away. We didn't know anything about him. We wanted to do right by burying him here. To me, this is becoming more and more frustrating, but I think maybe that is why they are all suddenly coming down with tuberculosis. Maybe he was infected and brought it in, even though he seemed perfectly healthy. But then, he has only been here for a short time, certainly not enough to get the whole village sick, but obviously long enough for them to shoot him in the back of the head. Who will give me permission, I ask, to dig up the body? You don't need it. Marek is wringing his hands. We nailed the coffin shut, and then we put him in the church. He's still in there. I look through the door again, and sure enough, there's the undertaker standing at the church door, pistol in hand, just in case. I see. No, Madoc says. He is almost crying, and he is wringing his hat furiously in his hands. My assistant has all but given up. Madoc says, you don't see. People with blood on their clothes are sitting up in coffins, and then there is blood on our pillows in the morning. I don't believe you see at all. So there we are, my assistant and I, standing in the little stone church at Bistrina, and the coffin of the man called Gavo is there, lying at an angle from the door as if it's been shoved in pretty quickly. It's a dusty wooden coffin. The church is stone and quiet. It smells of sandalwood and wax, and there is an icon of the Virgin above the door. The windows are blue glass. It is a beautiful, it is a beautiful church but it is obvious that no one has been in it for a long time. The candles are all out, and this fellow's coffin is covered with a few spatters of white, which the doves that live in the belfry have been dropping down on him. It is a sad thing to see, because as far as I know, this man has done nothing to deserve being shot in the back of the head at his own funeral twice. <laughs> After we come in, the undertaker closes the door behind us quickly and suddenly, and for a long time everything is quiet in the little church. We've come in with our satchels, and we've also brought a crowbar to open the coffin, and we begin to realize that perhaps we should have brought in more than just the crowbar, a team of oxen, for example, because the coffin has not only been nailed shut, but also crisscrossed with extra boards across the lid and chained around and around with what looks like a bicycle chain. Someone, probably as an afterthought, has thrown a string of garlic onto the coffin, and the heads are lying there in their paper shells. My assistant manages to say to me, Shame, awful shame. Then he spits and says, peasants. And then we hear something that is altogether incredible, something you cannot even begin to appreciate because without hearing for yourself the way it sounded in the quiet church, you won't believe it happened. It is the sound of shuffling movement. And then, all of a sudden, a voice from the coffin, frank, polite, slightly muffled voice says, Water. Thank you. <laughs>